Okay, we're good. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Kansas City Oasis. I am Nikki Actipis, the board president and your host for this morning. So if you are new to our community or this is one of your first times joining in or you just like hearing our goodness, why am I blanking today? You like hearing our little mantra of people are more important than beliefs. Be accepting, be accepted. La um, oh goodness, see, I'm just messing this all up this morning. Let's, let's start that over again. So <laughs> be accepted, be accepting, be accepted. Reality is known through reason, human hands solve human problems and people are more important than beliefs. And our last one is Cobra Kai never dies. Um, thank you, Jack, for that. So <laughs> we have a great lineup this morning. Um, so I'm really excited. I'm super excited for this. Our musical guest is Helen Gillette on the cello. And our community moment is our very own Jack Cooley, the birthday boy today. And our featured speaker is Grady Atwater, who will be giving us a tour of the John Brown Museum. So without further embarrassing myself for forgetting our um, mission statement this morning, I will turn it over to Helen. Good morning, everybody. I'm gonna start with the song that I wrote about starting my life in Belgium and ending up in Louisiana. Um, it's called Atchafalaya. Um, and then I'm gonna go into a little outro that's based on a French children's song about uh, sort of falling into the, falling over and just giving up when there's just one little thing that goes wrong. And um, I was sort of making fun of, in, in, in hopes to get rid of that habit, making fun of it in a song. So uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoy. And just for you geeks out there, I'm using a Boss RC50 loop station at my feet, which I know you can't see, but I opted for you to see the whole cello instead. So here we go.
clapping because I can I'm see it though can see it. well that was very excellent thank you so much my pleasure and we will hear from you in a little bit again um and yeah I'm looking forward to it thank you so after that beautiful performance I would like to make a quick announcement um, before I turn the floor over to Jack. If you are interested in doing this lovely job of MC, this morning we posted on the private page the, that we are seeking new MCs and the interview questions are on there um, as a Google form, but you can email your answers to me in that Google document or you can just copy paste and then write your answers and e email them off to me. Um, so we are looking for more MCs. No public speaking skills necessary. As you see this morning, they're still letting me do it. Um, so you can too. You just need to be interested in supporting our community in this way and available every couple of Sundays. So please, if you're interested, check out that post. Um, and I look forward to seeing your applications. So our next segment is what we all know, or maybe if you're new, you don't know, our community moment. And our community moments are from community members to just give them the floor for a little bit to talk about what they're invested in, um, maybe a life goal they've recently accomplished or just some fun information. And so that's, that's what we do. We allow our community members to come up and do that or get on the screen as we are nowadays and just you know speak from their hearts and get to share with us. So our community moment this morning is our very own Jack Cooley. And he gave me his three words, but since he's been being a punk this morning, I kind of want to change them. Um, but I won't. That is your birthday present from me is that I'm being nice to you, Jack. His three words are handsome, sexy, and humble. And if Jack were to have a warning label, it would be Cobra, Cobra Kai never dies. So without further ado, Mr. Jack Cooley, can you, can you take the floor, please? Hello, Oasis. Uh... Let's see, I've unmuted myself. All right, happy day everyone. It is my birthday, but also and more importantly, it is Dexter's birthday. He's currently licking himself. So happy birthday, Dexter. Um, he wanted to do the community moment today, but his, um, he wanted to talk about how his, um, he, he tore the arm off of his Gumby. And I thought that was a little bit violent for today's uh, you know, program. So. We're going to go get him a new Gumby this afternoon. So uh, I moved here in 2015. So I'm fairly new to Kansas City. And I am completely in love with Kansas City. I know that in our modern times, everything seems dark and scary and sad and depressing and disappointing. Um, but 
we live in a, in a really beautiful city with many beautiful things. And I want to tell you some of my favorite things and invite you to join me in that. And there is a plethora of things in Kansas City that you can do and see either for free or almost for free, just going out and exploring. Dexter and I walk about 20 to 30 miles a week around the city. And we have many places we'd like to go regularly. I'm also a hopeless romantic and I love going and watching sunsets. And over the last five years, I have a accrued a list of my favorite places to go in the city to see and some of my favorite places to see the sunset. So I'm going to share some of that list with you. If I don't get through all of it, I'm going to, I'll post it on the private group for anybody that's interested. So my invitation to you is to uh, take it upon yourself to go re-fall in love with this city again. Go check these things out and enjoy these enjoy. things. So I'm going to see if I can Am I, am I able to share my screen? Can I do that? All right. Can you make that happen? Yeah, I'm making it happen right now. Okay, there we go. There we go. So, all right. So, um, yes. So I am very excited and I hope that I wanted to invite, invite you through this presentation about things to also be excited. And uh, the first thing that I wanted to tell you about, of course, is the Nelson Atkins. Now, we all know the Nelson Atkins. I call it the crowning jewel of Kansas City. Uh, it is a world-class art museum, and it's free right here in the heart of our city. It's close to where I live. Dexter and I walk the grounds there at least once a week. It's excellent rabbit chasing territory, if you're into that. And uh, so I want to encourage you not just to go to the Nelson, but also check out the grounds and uh, the park that's to the south of it there as well. Of course, Union Station, but if you haven't gone up, when you walk in the front doors, you turn around and go all the way to the left. You go up the stairs, the second floor, the whole floor is dedicated to the renovation of Union Station, and it's got displays and cool stuff there, and a cool overview overlooking the big clock and the, the gallery area there, so I recommend that. Of course, Liberty Memorial, including the grounds, also a great place to go walk and exercise and picnic, that kind of stuff. Loose Park uh, is, I think Loose Park is the, the central park of Kansas City. It is, it is the, uh, obviously the, the pride of the parks department. They maintain it like no other park in the city and it's very well done. And one of the things I would encourage you to do there when you go to Loose Park is take your time, have a picnic and look at trees. There is trees throughout that I love. Dexter and I go visit and check on them and see how they're doing um, and, and give those trees names and really take time to in, enjoy them. Of course, the World War I Museum there at Liberty Memorial, that costs a little bit of money and I'm not sure currently if it's open or you might have to set an appointment to do that. Kaufman Memorial Gardens, they are at the south end of the lawn there from the Nelson Atkins and Thieves Park and they're right by Brush Creek. That's actually where the Kaufmans are buried. Their gravestones are there. And you know you are a baller if you actually have memorial gardens that people can go see <laughs> where you were buried. So uh, this is free and you could go walk through there. They're constantly changing the greenery and the flowers and the fountains and it's just absolutely wonderful. Right now you can't get in the building to visit the big fat cat that lives there, but she's pretty awesome um, if you want to see her as well. The Colonnade, which is up in North KC, a lot of people don't know where the colonnade is. That's a great place to watch the sunset. And there's cool stairs there going to Cliff Drive on the back side of that. So I highly recommend checking out the colonnade. Swope Memorial is at Swope Park, but it's at the far end across the valley. So if you go across from Starlight, across from the Kansas City Zoo, on the high side of the valley, uh, Swope Memorial is where Charles Swope is buried. And it overlooks the whole valley. It's right there by the old, uh, the old golf course. And so I recommend checking that out. And there's some trails there as well that you can check out. That's one of my favorite places to watch the sunset because you can overlook the valley, especially this time of year as the trees are turning. The Kansas City Workhouse is in the 18th and Vine District. And it is uh, a really cool place. It's just what it sounds like. It, it used to be a workhouse for people coming out of the prison system and prison labor. And now it's sitting empty. Last time I drove by it, they had fences around it. So I don't know if you can currently get in there. I don't know what your personal feelings are on hopping fences. I don't really do well with rules. So I don't think the fences really stop me from going in there and checking it out. You want to wear hard shoes. Don't go there with open-toed shoes because it's, it's a demo site and it's in pretty bad shape. 
So you want to be careful if you go there, but it's a really cool place. And on the back, if you walk up the ramp, you got a really cool view over some train tracks and overlooking downtown from a different perspective. Of course, a streetcar. I'm in love with the streetcar. I'm a, I'm a come from a small town. And every time I get on the streetcar, I'm like, this is so cool. We have a streetcar. Um, then we have the Scout. If you haven't been to the Scout, I recommend checking that out. It's a unique view of downtown from that angle. The river market is cool always, but I always recommend going to Planters. Planters is the second oldest hardware store in the city, and it's where I go to buy all my spices. So when you walk in Planters, you just get hit with this face full of wonderful smells from their spices. And I like their soup mixes. I like their seasoning mixes. Uh, I buy my salt there. Uh, so I recommend Planters there. West Bottoms, First Fridays is not what it used to be. Um, but it's still a pretty cool place and West Bottoms is getting converted into some different places and some really good places to eat there, some good restaurants, so I'd recommend that as well. Cliff Drive in the historic uh, part of Kansas City, it's the old highway that's been shut down and now it's for foot traffic. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, I like to park on one end and walk a loop through it. It's about six and a half miles uh, to do that, so it's a pretty good walk. And um, I go during the day because it's not necessarily the safest place to be when it's dark. Um, so go during the day uh, or go in the evening because uh, it's, it's really cool views and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> Rosedale Arch is over there kind of close to the Scout and it's a, uh, another war memorial and it has a list of a lot of, of veterans there as well. And it's a cool view of downtown. It's a great place to picnic there. They got some picnic tables up. Of course, the zoo, and I'm not sure how they're set up right now, but you can go and support the zoo. Um, downtown Public Library, I think, is, is a place a lot of people don't know about. Right there on 10th Street, you could take the streetcar to the library stop, get off, go to the library. It's a converted bank. It's gorgeous inside. Some days, if you go on Tuesdays at lunchtime, they'll have members of the symphony playing there in the lobby. And on, in the basement where the vault was is now a theater. You can go and sit in there and watch documentaries and stuff like that. It's super cool building. And then if you go up to the top floor, uh, before sundown, they have a terrace you can walk out on and they got one of those big honking chess sets and you can overlook downtown. It's really cool. So I recommend that. That's a great date to do something like that. Of course, the Harry Wiggins Charlie Track Trail is a great walk or a bike ride or a jog. Uh, I recommend that, especially this fall as the trees are turning. It's really cool. Case Park in West Bottoms Overlook. Case Park is right downtown. It's close to the library and the garment district. And it's the, the highest park in town and it overlooks the rivers where the rivers come together and uh, really nice views of West Bottoms as well. Again, probably a, a place that's better visited during the daytime hours. Um, Caw Point is, uh, of course, uh, the famous place where Lewis and Clark uh, stayed for three days and really cool historical stuff there. So I recommend go check that out and run around. Uh, it's not a really big area, but it's a pretty unique area and it's a great view of downtown as well. Then of course, the Negro Leagues Museum, super cool history. And uh, one of the places that I think a lot of people haven't been to here in Kansas City. Then the town of Candace Bridge and Berkeley Riverfront. Um, the town of Candace Bridge is, is the, the lock bridge where people put their locks on there. And it's a really cool view. And you just get to really get a picture for how quick the Missouri River runs right by there. And so I enjoy that. And so does Dexter. He likes that view. Observation Park, which is off of Southwest Traffic Way. It's another high point that overlooks downtown. It's just this little park up on this plateau, which by the way, a plateau is the highest form of flattery. <laughs> Dad joke for you, get it? Cause it's high, it's flat. So um, observation point, really cool place to go and kick around and have a picnic. And then Scarrett Point, which is my number one spot currently to watch the sunset. So if you're walking Cliff Drive and you time it just perfectly, you can watch the sunset at Scarrett Point on your way back. And if you go in the springtime, there is a massive mulberry tree and you can get a snack while you're watching the sunset and it's pretty cool. So do that, somebody date me please. Uh, 2025, my last one is the English Landing Walking Trail. And I just recently discovered this and this is up in, in Parkville. And it's, it's a, a place to walk right along the English, uh, right along the river and uh, really nice, quiet space, lots of families, volleyball court, stuff like that. So some of the places that I enjoy seeing, I think I'm out of time. Anyway, I just wanna invite you to fall in love with this city and do things that are, that are uh, exciting, do things that are new and, and remind yourself the good things about Kansas City and don't just focus on all of the, the things that are negative about it. Fall in love with the city, take people that you love, do social distancing, wear your mask, don't be stupid, trust science, 
but go fall in love with the city. Do that this fall. It's perfect time to go do it over the next few weeks. Thanks. Thank you, Jack, the birthday boy for that. Uh, I think I was at the arch yesterday. We accidentally found the arch. So that was really cool. And also I'm gonna let you get away with those really bad puns today because again, it is your birthday. So me being nice to you is my birthday present to you. So with that, well, before actually, before I transition over to our coffee break, we have, if you go to our private page, there is a Halloween event for the kiddos that is going to be virtual. Hmm. Well, I would give you that information if my computer was letting me open it. But go check out the private page. We have an event for the kiddos for Halloween. It is going to be a virtual thing, I believe. And if I can get Facebook to work on my computer again, I will post that information in the chat. So without further ado, we are going to go to our coffee, our virtual coffee break for the next 10, 15 minutes. If you are new to this, you will get put into a room randomly. It's like breakout room roulette. You might get to see some faces you know, you might get to see some new faces. Who's, who's, who's to say? So. Go get your coffee, have some conversation, and we will be back here in a few minutes for our featured speaker. And just as a reminder for those of you who are sticking around in the main room, please remember we are still live streaming. So keep your conversations. If you would like to come off mute, keep them PG. Um, Cause otherwise you are going to be on Facebook live saying weird, weird things.
Well, maybe I should take myself off of mute. Let's try this again. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you had a lovely coffee break and made some new friends or got to catch up with some old friends. So right now we are going to welcome Helen back to the floor to play us some lovely music again. All right, I can do that. Hello again. Wave your hands in the air if you can hear me. Okay, good. Well, I had a lovely coffee break. I hope you, you did too. That was really nice. Meet some new people. Um, and um, yeah, I, I w was reminded, of course, to think uh, the, the reason I'm here is because of my friend Genevieve and Jeremy. Um, we went to college together at Beloit College in Wisconsin. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. All right. I actually am celebrating my 20th uh, year graduating Beloit College. So can't believe it's been 20 years. Woo! Still here. All right. Um, I'm going to do an instrumental. This is called Kibi, and it was inspired by Brazilian uh, food that I ate and uh, I love food. So, um, you know, why not be inspired by that to write music? Um, and so this is uh, gonna start out real percussive. There's no singing, so, um, but I, I get to nerd out with some rhythms in the cello. So hope you like it. Here's Kibi. Thank you. 
awesome. And hopefully you can see everybody still clapping. Yay. Thank you guys so much. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Helen. And we will hear from you at the end of our program. Sounds good. So we are now on to our featured speaker for today. If you've not been here before or you just need a little refreshing, our featured speakers are usually somebody from the community or a national organization or something of that matter. And they come to give us a little bit of education about maybe a topic that the community is interested in or that is just really relevant to what's happening in the world. And even though COVID-19 has been a hot mess and we can't be together in person, it has really allowed us to expand how we get our speakers. And today is one of those, is one of those times where we get to um, something a little bit more interactive and also we have somebody in who you know might not be able to do on a Sunday morning uh because it's a long drive so this morning we have Grady Atwater who is going to give us a tour of the John Brown Museum and I will let him introduce himself and give a little bit of his background and then yeah and then show us show us around and and give us some, uh, give us the lowdown on John Brown. So, Mr. Atwater, it's uh, you have the floor. Hello, I like to. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm happy, uh, happy to tell you about something that is relevant to today. Uh, this is uh, that is uh, the role of John Brown and the abolitionist movement in shaping history and the civil rights movement. <laughs> Now, uh, what uh, I'll give you a, a short tour of the of the museum. Uh, this is uh, we are in the John Brown Museum State Historic Site, and uh, this uh, this is the uh, headquarters that John Brown had here in uh, Kansas Territory. But it's more than that, more than just a mere cabin. This uh, the cabin you are going to see here, and I'll try to put it to so where everybody can see, um, uh, is um, is the uh, <clears throat> was the home of Reverend Samuel Adair and his wife Florella, and we are in the we're in the front room of the cabin now, and it was uh, purchased by the Adairs in 1854. They moved in in 1855, and before John Brown came, this became a station on the Underground Railroad, uh, escaping slaves coming in from from Missouri uh, would come over here. We are about three miles as the crow flies from Missouri, and so slaves could get here sometimes in uh, one or two days if they were escaping. And uh, very often, uh, the slaves would have would find a home here and be taken on generally from here either to Lawrence, was the next leg of the Underground Railroad. Now, uh, the cabin itself here, and I'll go around the room, hopefully not give everybody motion sickness here, uh, is a rather large cabin for the day. Because of the reality that it was a, a, a trading post before the Adairs bought it. And, it was moved to this particular site in John Brown Memorial Park in 1912 to preserve it. And the pergola was built around it. You're gonna see there's a stone pergola around it. Uh, the, it was added in 1927. Now it's interesting to note that all of this began to occur for a roughly exactly the same time that you had a lot of the Confederate statues going up because uh, the uh, the Northern version of the United Daughters of the Confederacy was actually the Women's Relief Corps of the Grand Army of the Republic. And they were doing the same thing uh, that, the, that the United Daughters of the Confederacy were doing. They were putting up statues. They were making sure they, uh, that as the Civil War veterans were dying, that they would be remembered in the North as well as in the South. So we. Owe, the, owe a lot to the Women's Relief Corps of the Grand Army of the Republic for 
all of the north, you know, the northern underground railroad and other uh, civil war sites in the north being preserved because they were the really the force behind it. Now, one of the things to understand here about uh, this cabin is that it was unusual because of the fact that it had, it was a church, it was a hospital because Reverend Samuel Adair and his wife Florella were Congregationalist missionaries. Uh, and they come out here to be missionaries and in a peaceful way to make sure that slavery would be abolished. And Florella Adair, I'll show you a picture, was an unusual woman for her time in that she had a college education. She went to Oberlin College, which still exists. Uh, and she was one of, she graduated in third class of, of graduates. Now, Oberlin College was unique in that it admitted women and African Americans. It was the first college in the United States to admit uh, women and, and African Americans. And uh, so, therefore, it was considered radical. And uh, the reason it was considered radical is that there was a genuine, uh, well, pseudoscience. It was pseudoscience, and I think most everybody knew it, but it, it, fit, it fit the cultural ideals of the day that if women became educated, they would literally become insane. And the reason that that was thought was when women became educated and they learned how to read, they began to question things. They would not sign contracts when they ordered to. They would not, uh, you know, just blindly agree to things uh, once once they became educated. So uh, the sexism of the day was that no one could actually admit that women were intelligent, equally as intelligent as men. So they they they, they chalked it up to to being insane. Uh, in the going insane and education would make them go insane. The other thing that would happen, they said, if women became educated, got college educations, is that uh, that literally, quite literally, their uteruses would shrivel. Uh, there was a genuine medical belief. I am, you know, pseudoscience, but still doctors swore by it. That And this was because once women became educated, they decided, I do not want to have 20 children. Uh, and so once again, the sexism of the day, men could not accept the fact that women had a strong enough mind to resist, ha you know, having multiple children, and they accounted that to be something, you know, that uh, that was due to the education. Now, so Florella was, was viewed as a revolutionary for her day, merely because she had the temerity to go to college. Uh, Reverend Adair was uh, considered to be a radical. And we have to understand that uh, Samuel Adair was, uh, here we go, this is Samuel Adair. Uh, he was an, uh, an abolitionist. Uh, he believed in the equality of African-Americans and whites uh, in a time when most people believed that they were subhuman. And so uh, what that happened, you know, and that was accounted to be ra radical insanity. And uh, that, you know, when people accuse John Brown of being crazy or insane, they were accusing all, virtually every abolitionist of being insane because the prevailing notion was that African Americans were quite literally subhuman. And to say that, that African Americans were equals to whites uh, marked you as being mentally ill. And uh, the Adairs backed that, as did John Brown. Now, the cabin here. Uh, it has a loft that was added. I'm gonna go upstairs if you're sitting there wondering if I'm making you swim a little bit. A set of stairs here. And uh, this is a loft. Now uh, this loft, I'm gonna do go around. Uh, this loft was added by John Brown and his five sons at the behest of Florella Adair, who wanted some privacy, <clears throat> bluntly put, because everybody was living in one room and, and her and her daughters wanted privacy. And it was a safety measure because during the guerrilla war here in Kansas territory, you had uh, 
the, one of the common things was a home invasion. So they wanted the children upstairs in case bullets were flying down here in the main room. John Brown and his five sons therefore added that. Uh, one of the interesting things about this cabin is we are unique in that we have all of the original furniture. Everything is in here is original except for the folding chairs they are from the 1940s i'm going to use them until they break so buy that i, I always look for that brand when i'm buying chairs and the textiles in any house museum if they're honest with you they've replaced them because you have to now uh this is the back room to the cabin we're going to go around okay and the front room is really Adair's room, and the back room uh, is where they have, where we have a lot of our John Brown related art artifacts. Most most everything is. Uh, you will note that the floor here is 20th century, uh, and the ceiling has been replaced. This is it because the windows and most of the ceiling had to be replaced because a thief broke into the cabin in 1995 and set the cabin on fire. And uh, I try to plagiarize or, you know, tell stories uh, if anymore and try to make things look old. That, that's an academic law, so we don't do it. If there's a disaster, uh, just a disaster happened. Okay. <clears throat> Now we're going to get into, uh, I'm going to show you something when, when, I, when I sit back down to talk to you, I'm going to tell you more about this. But what we have here is we have a, a large, the room back here, we have multiple uh, items that were owned by John Brown. For instance, in this display, we have some uh, items that were owned by John Brown and used by John Brown here in Kansas territory. Uh, and uh, we have a, a portrait of John Brown and a melodeon that was given to John Brown by his, uh, um, to, given to John Brown to his sister, to his daughter Ruth when she was married in 1846, and that was played at his funeral. Now, uh, to show you that John Brown has always been and still is uh, nationally important, uh, internationally important, I'm gonna show you something that people miss sometimes when they come to the museum, but when hopefully you can come sometime. I'm going to show you something that people miss, and hopefully you're seeing that. That is a bronze medal given by the government of France to the city of Oswatomie to be displayed here, uh, very basically to uh, honor the community for its role in being a flashpoint during the uh, 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 during a flashpoint during the bleeding Kansas or the the, the guerrilla war and for its part in free and in, in, in getting free and seeking freedom that was the government uh, the, the government of uh, victor hugo that did that uh, they gave a gold solid gold one to john brown's widow uh who uh was living in poverty and they told her to sell it and she did now um that we always tend to leave you know history sometimes uh tends to leave women out and uh, i don't so that for the reason um, so, uh, I'm going to show you something here. This is Mary Day Brown and two, the two daughters, Annie and Sarah. Uh, Mary Day, uh, John Brown had two wives, um, uh, and, uh, Diane Lusk Brown, who bore him seven children, and she, uh, died in childbirth with the seventh child. Uh, if you're ever traveling to Pennsylvania, uh, that go out by her, that go out to meet Bill in that area. They have the tannery, and if you probably, if they, people who still own it, you can go up the hill and you can see the grave. And I've seen the grave where he was buried, where she's buried. You see, she was buried with the child in her arms. A uh, very common thing: women died in childbirth a lot because of the lack of germ theory and prenatal care, and the fact from the time that culturally speaking, from the time. Usually women married very young, 16, 17 years old, in many cases, especially on the frontier. And they were, uh, they were with child, they were pregnant uh, virtually year in, year out until they could, until they were in their thirties. 
And a lot of, you know, child di dying during childbirth was one of the top reasons that people, women died simply because they would get worn down and unable to have children and unable to survive the uh, childbearing experience. Now I'm gonna go out of the cabin and we are the site of the Battle of Osawatomie. It was the largest battle during the Bleeding Kansas era. And that's why this was set aside. And Theodore Roosevelt came and dedicated this park. We have other, we have other exhibits on the outside of the cabin here uh, on the pergola wall. So, but to, uh, just for the sake of brevity, I'll uh, <coughs> sit down here. Now, when we said, now that all said, um, uh, what, I'm getting a reflection, I'm sorry. Uh, now that all said, let's um, uh, talk a little bit about what, uh, why John Brown is important. You know, why do we have John, why is it that everywhere, literally I can go across, I, as a matter of fact, every time I travel, I've gone to every place that we took a trip once. Uh, when I was going to go speak at a uh, event at a, a convention in uh, in Richmond, uh, Virginia, and so I, I noticed that the route north to Virginia, we hit all the John Brown spots. The route south, the other, I went to John Brown spots uh, town, including Harper's Ferry. Why is it that everywhere John Brown so much stopped and had dinner that they're they preserved it i mean you you find that every house every thing that you know everywhere he lived everything he did you know it's, it's memorialized it's because john brown is still important today and the reason john brown is important today is that he is an archetype for the ideologically or a philosophically motivated activist. And the reason is he ticks off every box for a philosophical discussion of the morality or immorality or uh, of an action, the timing of a choice of how to act for, for a belief system, uh, whatever that belief system might be. Uh, and so every time something like this comes up, like the you see the civil unrest that we're having now over over racism, um, what's happening? You know, you see John Brown's name is brought up. Right now, uh, I've had multiple people who were members of the uh, um, of the uh, of the John Brown Gun Club come through the museum. I've then I I've had members of the uh, of of Antifa I come through, I had members of, of I've had members of the, the Sons of the Confederacy come through. Uh, I've had people who come in and chew and yell at me about <laughs> why we have a museum to that killer. <laughs> you know, uh, my day is never boring. In other words, I never know. And I have visitors come from all over the world. And the reason is that John Brown, he's, he's almost, he's like, he has all the properties of really great literature in that it's timeless because it acts, uh, he asks timeless questions when you start thinking about him. When is it right for someone to engage in a violent act, for instance, uh, to combat evil? When is it? Is it ever, is it not? And this is what happened. Now, what motivated John Brown, and I'll give you about a five minute thing, hopefully of my, now, my master's thesis was I wanted to find out what motivated John Brown, what ideals, what, what cultural ideals and beliefs motivated him. And I found out something very interesting when I was looking, when I did the, when I wrote my master's thesis on Brown about this, that it was his Calvinist religious belief, Christian religious beliefs. And what's interesting to note is that if you examine his Calvinist belief system, it, it dovetails very nicely, say, with humanism quite a bit. What he believed was, and this is the root of it, now he, he was not a completely traditional Calvinist, uh, but he had kind of his own spin on it. But he believed, and I give you the nutshell version, uh, that all people are equal in the eyes of God. 
And therefore, if they're equal in the eyes of God, all people, regardless of whether they're male or female, black, white, Asian, whatever, they should be treated as equals. They're equals. Male, you know, he didn't, he didn't treat anybody differently. Secondarily, he believed, did not believe necessarily, quote unquote, in miracles. And this is a part of, of Calvinism too, is that God doesn't necessarily work miracles. God gave human beings all the tools they needed to solve their problems. And therefore, it is God's not necessarily going to come solve a problem for you. So therefore, it is the duty of somebody, of human beings, if they have a problem, to, to think and solve it themselves. Uh, sociologists and uh, uh, sociologists have used this as this is one thing that helped to uh, create the Protestant work ethic. Uh, now, <clears throat> here's where the, the part that motivated Brown. Brown believed, and many Calvinists believe that, if you saw an act of evil being done, that God was not going to strike them dead with lightning or they weren't going to get divine retribution, you, as the person seeing that evil done, were God's arm on earth. And if you allowed that to continue, then you were as evil as the evildoer. And, and when eternity came, you would pay the same price as the evildoer. And John Brown was famous for doing things like this. Like one time uh, back in uh, when he was living uh, in Ohio, uh, in, in near Hudson, Ohio, he was going, his, his, wife, his uh, wife was literally sick, and he saw that two boys were uh, two, uh, climbing off and stealing, stealing apples from someone's apple orchard. Well, he stopped because he saw it, and he, you know, the good Lord put him there, and he stopped the boys, and he made them, you know, put, you know, make restitution to the, to the, to the, um, um, to the orchard. He did, he did like that. You know, when he, you know, he saw an evil, you know, I was put here to stop it. And that's what motivated him. Now, you know, and so uh, that's, it's just an interesting thing when you, you start studying it, uh, the complexities of it. Now it's more complex than that. It was, it was, a, uh, but I gave you the gist of it. Now, uh, so therefore, now why did he, we know a few things that frequently we ask questions about Brown is, okay, that being the case, why did he choose violence? John Brown was not always a violent abolitionist. He was, he was, a, he was raised, he was, he was raised in an abolitionist home. And, um, uh, uh, he was raised in an abolitionist home and he was inculcated with it. He had, he, now he, he experienced something that is death to racism. And that is actually having contact with people of other races. Usually that is death to racism because once you find out that, you know, all African-Americans are not bad people, you become less racist. Uh, and he had, his home was a station on the Underground Railroad. And so he visited with, helped, got to know African-Americans as he was growing up. And so when people said things that were disparaging about African-Americans, he said, well, no, that's not necessarily the case. I've known several African-Americans who don't feel, don't act like, don't have that quality you're saying they have. That was inculcated into him. Hudson was also an abolitionist town. It was founded by abolitionists and it was a frequent destination for escaping slaves from the South. So he was brought up in this environment where slavery was wrong and African-Americans were treated with some equality. Now, not complete. Um, and he was not, and if he saw a, a racist act being perpetrated, uh, he was the first one to stand up to do something about it. And once again, that Calvinism, I've seen an evil, I've got to stand up, I've got to do something. Uh, he was going to a church um, in uh, Kent, Ohio. 
And um, even abolitionists, by our standards, were racist. Okay, they still ascribe, you know, to African Americans are inferior to whites to a certain degree. And John Brown was a uh, was a radical among radicals in that he believed in the pure equality of African Americans and whites. Well, he went to a, uh, a at the local church, which church that he belonged to, they were having a revival and they invited the entire community and the African-Americans came. And the fact that they allowed that this in this community, they allowed the African-Americans to attend the church service. That's that's an advancement. I mean, for the time. But they seated all the African-Americans in the back behind the stove where no one could really see them. And John Brown walked in the first night. And at, at this point, you you had a pew, you had a, a pew that in. If you've ever seen Congregationalist churches in New England, it's a box. And his family walked in, and the next night he came, he stood up in the middle of the service, and he very firmly says a discrimination has been made. And he got up, and just to make the point that the, that all people were equal in the eyes of God, he set the an African-American family in his family's pew box and went and sat behind the stove and sat there and crossed his arm and just looked at everybody. <laughs> it had the effect, and to quote John Brown, to quote Owen Brown, uh, his his second to oldest son. He said, uh, <laughs> he said the elders came around to reprove my father. He says they came away with a different point of view. <laughs> in other words, he had no no, he didn't back down an inch on it. So therefore. You know, John Brown truly believed in what he was doing. Now, was he violent? Yes, but he was not as violent as he's made out to be. And what happens is, what happened when was that John Brown was actually here in, in Kansas Territory when he was violent, was people who were only making direct threats against free state forces and free state settlers uh, by force of arms or was supporting those uh, free pro-slavery guerrillas. And so therefore, yes, he was violent, but he was the cool head in the room, contrary to what you might you know, see on TV and in the movies and all that, he was the cool head in the room, calming down younger, more radical, hothead, um, free state individuals, um, that wanted to go and really commit a lot of very cruel acts. And he says, no, 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 no. He said, that's, you know, that's not, that's not the right thing to do. Uh, he investigated, he uh, very basically looked, you know, he did reconnoiter and he found out who was the real threat. And then he might commit an act of violence only against the people who were the real threat. To the to the to the life of of the free state settlers. Now that said, I'm leaving into one thing here, and uh, and I, uh, I could, and then I'll open for questions. The Pottawatomie massacre. <clears throat> it's something that comes up every time we talk about John Brown. Uh, that uh, it's you know the one of the first things people mention. Let's explain about the Potawatomi Massacre. I'll give you the thumbnail version of it because I've written, I've done deep research into this. What happened was with the Potawatomi Massacre <clears throat> was that pro-slavery forces had poured into Kansas. Uh, there was something called Colonel Buford's Brigade. They had recruited uh, men from the South to come up and fight free state forces here in Kansas territory. And what had happened was it, uh, about a hundred of them had gathered outside of Osawatomie, about, you know, north of Osawatomie. And they were arming up to attack the town. Well, the hotheads, one of the young hotheads wanted to go, let's go fight, let's go attack them, let's go, you know. He said, John Brown said, calm down, cool your jets. Let's go reconnoiter first. And you have to understand, John Brown was a very cool-headed man and this is before Facebook when anyone knew what anyone looked like. And so he 
went into the camp as a surveyor, which was one of his occupations. And he asked, he says, why are you here? He says, well, we're going to attack Osawatomie. I mean, we're going to go over to there, kill and you know, wipe out all of the abolitionists in Lane, around, around Lane, uh, including the Browns, unaware they're looking right at Brown. And Brown's son <laughs> was the flag, was holding the, 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 the flag over there. And uh, one of the famous quotes that uh, John, that his, uh, that, um, that Owen, um, Solomon Brown said, he says, you know, father always had more trust in Providence than I do. And he says, I wanted to get out of there. He says, he, here he is being, and he said, okay. And he said, well, how do you know where the Browns are and where all these people live? And he said, there were about, there were about five people that were aiding them and were going to participate in this raid on the settlers around Lane. So here's what Brown did. Brown then went on the property of the five men who they mentioned. And he, this time he took some armed men in case things got hairy. And he looked at it and he surveyor again, they came out and they said, well, shame about those Browns and all these abolitionists around. What are you going to do? Well, next Wednesday, we're going to go out and burn them out. When they come out, we're going to kill them. Oh, okay. Then he said, to quote John Brown, he says that he says he was convinced they committed murder in their hearts already, and it was justified to attack them. And only then. So on the night of Mar on May 24th, um, 1856, John Brown and he took seven men and he had his men take broadswords. Paul had a hit list uh, of men that um, had made the threats that he had investigated, pulled those men out of their cabins. When he discovered that one of, the pre one of them was only 14 years old, uh, he, he spared it at the, at the senses of his mother there were two. Uh, there were two people who had the bad luck to be staying in one of the cabins. They were just travelers, and he let them go. The five men were taken out and killed with artillery swords. Uh, now uh, you're going to read that John Brown purposely cut their heads off and all that, and you know, slit. No, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, John Brown's sons did not know how to use swords, and they hacked instead of doing the military thing and cutting their throats. And uh, the, I'll tell you, they all had PTSD after that. Virtually all of them quit. They never, you know, and uh, the Kansas fight and one of them committed suicide because of the PTSD from that action. Uh, <clears throat> so John Brown, when he was questioned about it, didn't deny it. He said, I let it. And it had the effect he was after. Um, a lot of the pro-slavery people skedaddled and now, whether or not that makes him a terrorist or a freedom fighter, I don't tell people what to think. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you one thing that I, in my research that I found that people gloss over a lot. Some, and there's a historical sin called presentism, okay? And in presentism, that's judging the people of the past or evaluating them purely by the standards of today. Okay, by the standards of the day, it was not an, at all completely uncommon. If you had a, a perceived threat against your people, uh, or you had a cause for people to organize a military force ad hoc and go fight, you know, there was a man named William Walker who literally invaded. Mexico, he invaded uh, Nicaragua, took over the government for about a month or so of Nicaragua, was recognized by the United States government. Uh, the swords John Brown got was from a man, Am uh, was Ambrose Beer was a man named Ambrose Beers, who was planning on invading Canada. I mean, so it was un uh, not unusual if you had a cause to arm yourself at the time and go try to do something about your cause. The federal government didn't necessarily come in and try to stop you. Uh, now, <clears throat> so I'm not saying that makes you change the world you should involved or not. That's I'm going to leave up to individuals. But that there's that mollifying 
reality that culturally it was not at all unusual for someone to um, basically take up arms. Now, this park is a site of the Battle of Osawatomi, uh, and it was a battle where John Brown, uh, I'm always learning new things, but or basically, in a nutshell, what he did was he, uh, he walked the road into town for an hour, uh, about 45 minutes to an hour, and prevented a large force that wanted to capture him and burn Osawatomi because it was a free state capital, it was a free state flashpoint, and the place a lot of slaves were coming through here. And it was fought on the site. And if you're reading in the history books where John Brown is known as Osawatomi Brown, he was given it because of his brave stand, as it was literally him and around 30 men against 250 to 400 pro slavery men. And he, and he held out for an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. So, uh, uh, with, you know, now, of course, we all know about Harper's Ferry, or if you don't, uh, John Brown uh, was a guerrilla fighter. And uh, what happened was it in that um, was that John Brown, uh, the free state people won in Kansas. I mean, they just outpopulated the uh, and out 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 fought the um, um, the pro the free the 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 um, I'm gonna get up here because I think I'm in the sun. Mr. They out they out they out. Uh, Yes, ma'am. I so I I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think we're running short on time, um, and we need. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay because I have been so engrossed by what you've been telling us today. Um, that so that's that's on me. I should have said something earlier. Um, but yeah, we are running short on time, so we won't be able to get to questions today. Um, but I want to thank you for your time and also encourage folks to hop on the museum website page that um, I posted in the chat. Um, and would it be okay if I shared your e email address with folks in case they have questions? Absolutely. I, and I live, I, I'm constantly doing research on this and I'm learning new things all the time. Awesome. And I love that. I live, I live to answer questions. Awesome. Well, Again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to um, interrupt, um, but like I said, we are short on time, and I just want to say thank you so much for coming today and showing us the museum. Um, and I'm hoping folks can come check it out in person soon. Oh, I'm looking forward to having them. And uh, you know, when they're, when a visit with things, just you can either call and talk, or you can ask me questions uh, through email. I'm 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 available. I apologize if I went a little too long. Too long. I apologize. No, you are you are you are all right. It has been a great morning, so I, I appreciate it. I, I know everybody else appreciates it. Okay. So with that, I want to welcome Helen back up, um, and just everybody again. Uh, thank you to Jack and um, Mr. Atwater and Helen uh, for our music today. And I just want to give a reminder that Kansas City Oasis is a five hundred one c three. So if you are able to um, make a monthly donation or a one-time donation, get on our website at kcoasis.org and click the donate button and it will walk you through how to, to do that. Um, those donations keep us going, keep us getting speakers in, keep us getting good musicians um, and eventually a new in-person space when this is all over. Um, or if it's safe, well, I should say when it's over, when it's safer for folks to gather in person. Um, and with that, I'm going to shut up and turn it back over to Helen. Take it away, Helen. You're muted. You're still muted. There you are. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, thank you again for having me. Thank you to uh, Genevieve for contacting me to do this. Happy to be here. I'm going to leave you with a song about uh, uh, about being a culture vulture. But 
um, it's it's kind of a um, it's just a, a, a way of of uh, basically summing up the fact that you know I I learned music from all different places and we all learn from um, from our teachers including our wonderful speaker, uh, historian. History is very important. It was really enlightening. Thank you so much for the, the history lesson. Um, and uh, it was a good refresher on Calvinism. It was really good. So thank you. And thanks for having me. And here's Vautour, which means vulture in French. Um, have a great, great Sunday. Bye. Thank you. And before we head out, if you could quickly give us um, the rundown on your social media accounts and any upcoming upcoming events that you might have. 
Yeah, yeah, I've got a really special uh, live show coming up in New Orleans on October 8th. It's a Thursday, and there's going to be two sets uh, at 2 p.m. Um, October 8th and also at 7 p.m. Um, 2 p.m. will be with a drummer, and 7 p.m. will be with a trombone player, wonderful New Orleans musicians. And it's, a, it's one of our local venues called DBA, um, and you can find it on a, there's a streaming platform that's really growing called Stage It that has live shows that you pay concert tickets for, um, and, it, and they don't get archived, so you really just have to be there at the time of the show, just like you would for a live show. So you can go to Stage It and find that show. Um, it'll also be, I'll be advertising on my Instagram, it's just my name, Helen Gillet, I pronounce it the French way. It does look like Gillette without the last T-E though. <laughs> So Jolet, and um, you can find me on Instagram, and I just pulled my earring out, but no harm done. Um, you probably couldn't have seen that, but now you know. Um, anyway, Facebook also, Helen Jolet, and um, my website, helenjolet.com, will have some info about that show. Um, I also live stream every Monday at 7 p.m. Central Time. So, but this October 8th show is going to be really, really great. Chance to see me interact with a couple other musicians on a local stage. Um, you know, I, I think you have my Venmo and PayPal listed on your, on your, um, your website, so I don't need to go through all that. But yeah, I, you can stay in touch with me through Instagram, Facebook. Also, my YouTube channel, go check that out. I have an archive of shows that I've been doing since this whole thing started, including some really beautiful landscapes in New Mexico from the summer. So um, yeah, you can check all that out. Oh, and Bandcamp for merch. Go to bandcamp.com. You can buy merch, buy CDs, download digital downloads, order vinyl. I'll mail them to you. And it's bandcamp.com forward slash Helen Gillet. So I think that covers it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thanks again to everybody else today. Um, Jack Cooley, Mr. Grady Atwater, and everybody else who just tuned in at home. And we will see you all next sunday same zoom link same time have a good rest of the week everybody bye everybody